Hi, I'm Myrna Belzamillo. Welcome to Asian American Life, a new monthly magazine show from CUNY TV about the fastest growing immigrant community in the tri-state. As the months unfold, we'll take a close look at issues facing Asian Americans and the impact Asians have and will have on the social, economic, and political landscape of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We will also introduce you to the rich cultural tapestry that makes up the Asian community. But first, an overview. Pan-Asian Americans include people from over 40 countries, including China, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, the Philippines, India, Vietnam, who speak more than 150 languages and dialects. My name is Boto. I am from India. And now I am in New York City. I am living in Jackson Heights for 10 years. Hello, my name is Guo Wenyuan. I am from China. I have been in the United States for 6 years. Each group has its own unique history, from language and religion to social and political views. New York City has the largest Asian American population in the U.S., making up 13% of the city's population. That's larger than the entire population of San Francisco. You'll also find large pockets of Asian Americans living in New York's suburbs, Nassau County, Suffolk, Westchester County, and in New Jersey and Connecticut. The Asian community is the fastest growing race and ethnic group in the country, surpassing Hispanics as the largest group of new immigrants. In New York City alone, between 2000 and 2010, the Asian population grew by 30 percent. We'll feature the rich culture and contributions of Asian Americans across the tri-state area, business leaders and rising stars in entertainment, art, music, food, and much more. We will also profile different communities. For our premiere show, we thought the best place to start was right here in Chinatown, one of the oldest Chinese immigrant enclaves outside of Asia and a symbol of Asian immigration. To learn about the history of Chinatown and the Chinese immigrant community, the best place to start is right here at the Museum of Chinese in America on Center Street. So it was very much um, born and rooted in Chinatown to help preserve these things in Chinatown that were thought to be important, uh, to help educate others about the importance of this, and to form a collection to attest to the history and past of Chinatown. Helen Ko is executive director. The permanent exhibit here is called With a Single Step. Visitors learn what it was like to live as a Chinese American in the past, from the Discrimination to the Chinese Exclusion Act. That was a federal law passed in 1882 that restricted Chinese immigration to the U.S. Museum goers will also get a glimpse of Hollywood's early portrayal of the community. There are also artifacts from original Chinatown businesses, from the general stores to the laundry shops. There are also original art pieces and elaborate costumes, and a showcase of the many contributions the community has made. I hope that when people come, each time they come, they learn something different, something new, and to um, also be able to connect it with themselves, their own immigration story, because it is a story about immigration in this country is certainly a land of immigration. And it was an immigrant from Hong Kong who co-founded the museum. In 1980, Charlie Lai started the Chinatown History Project, which eventually was renamed the Museum of Chinese in America. We caught up with Charlie recently, taking a tour of his old Chinatown neighborhood. He immigrated here with his family in the 1960s. This um, building here is uh, the old PS23. And this is the central um, Chinatown Little Italy Elementary School. The Chinese population in New York and the rest of the country grew rapidly in 1968 after the U.S. government lifted the quotas on immigration. Many settled in Chinatown. Today, Chinatown still has a large Asian population, but many are moving away because of rising rents and better opportunities elsewhere. There are now four Chinatowns in the city, the largest two in Flushing and Sunset Park. But Manhattan's Chinatown is still a strong symbol of Chinese culture, a culture which is alive and well, as we found when we walked to busy Columbus Park.
it's a multi-generational you know, facility. While kids play nearby, the older generation gather for chess checkers and visit friends. And the narrow streets of Chinatown are still bustling with the ubiquitous fresh food markets and fishmongers. While shop owners have expressed concern about losing regular customers who have moved away, Manhattan's Chinatown is still a popular tourist destination. But Charlie, along with other longtime residents, hopes that visitors get more out of their visit. The thing to, that is really important is to not simply bring visitors to come into Chinatown to satisfy their, their craving for this exotic stereotype of, of a community. Um, that we want people to come to this area to learn something positive, relevant and important that the Chinese American community and the contributions of the Chinese American um, um, population um, to the broad American story. Hi, I'm Kyung Yoon with the story of photographer Corky Lee, who's been chronicling the Asian American experience. Okay. From dumplings to demonstrations, Corky Lee has captured them all with his camera. My mission is to uh, transform America uh, one photograph at a time. For more than 40 years, this self-taught photojournalist has been documenting the diversity and richness of Asian American culture and history. Photographs give Asian Americans visibility about their culture and about the history of Asians in this country. And that's uh, my primary mission. We read in the history books that um, America is a, a nation of immigrants. I just want to say that Asians uh, in this country are part and parcel of a much larger um, uh, picture. His work chronicles decades of Asian Americans demonstrating for civil rights and protesting hate crimes, injustice, unfair wages, and police brutality, like in this celebrated photo taken in 1975 that ran on the cover of the New York Post. His photos also show the everyday lives of Asian Americans at work and at play, in prayer and in celebration of their vibrant cultures. He has, you know, um, consistently taken these pictures and we're so fortunate in our community to have someone like Corky Lee. Frank Shi, the president of OCA Long Island, helped to organize the exhibition. If you look at his work, how many people do you know have, can show that they document Asian American life the way he does? And I can't think of anyone. And so I think he's been like the secret treasure that we have. I want to talk about um, photo documentation and, and photojournalism. Uh, there's basically two different things, and that's why I brought these two photographs up here. You have to remember that photography is all about light. His legacy includes motivating the next generation of photojournalists. Maybe uh, some of will come out of this uh, workshop that, that I'm doing. Uh, I know I'm inspiring people uh, uh, left and right, and you know, who knows. And the photograph that Corky Lee is most proud of? The photograph that I uh, talk about uh, the most uh, in recent memory within the last 10 years is the one of the Sikhs that I took on uh, four days after 9-11 in Central Park. This uh, individual has a turban and he has an American flag wrapped around his uh, shoulders. And then uh, to keep the flag from uh, falling off his shoulders, that was taken uh, because um, four days after 9-11, uh, across the country, there were a lot of Sikhs who were facing uh, hate crimes, uh, abuses, and, and so forth. Capturing moments in history as well as everyday life. If a picture paints a thousand words, Corky Lee speaks volumes about the Asian American experience. And soon the cameras will be turned on Corky Lee as he becomes the subject of a film documentary called 
photographic justice, the Corky Lee story. I'm Kyung Yoon for CUNY TV. The term Asian American was used informally by activists in the 1960s who sought an alternative to the term Oriental, arguing that the latter was derogatory and colonialist. Formal usage was introduced by academics in the early 1970s, notably by historian Yuji Ichioka, who is credited with popularizing the term. Ever wonder what our world will look like in 100 years? Will we be traveling in flying cars? Will we live forever? Well, just ask Michio Kaku. He's a physics professor here at CUNY, and he's author of the best-selling book, Physics of the Future. And his new book takes us on an incredible journey forward. Now, Michio, what makes your predictions of the future different from other futurists who predict the future? Well, let's be blunt about it. Most predictions about the future are made by historians, sociologists, and science fiction writers. I have nothing against them. I admire them. But I'm a physicist. We scientists are building the future. Michio Kaku teaches theoretical physics at the City College of New York. He's also a world-renowned scientist. He's published several books, is a frequent guest on television shows, and speaks about science around the globe. You can call him the rock star of the science community. It is his lifelong passion. Physicists created the internet, lasers, transistors, x-ray machines, television, radio, radar, microwaves, MRI machines, all of them were invented by physicists. And now we physicists are inventing the 21st century. He was born in California to Japanese immigrant parents. His parents met at the Tool Lake Segregation Center, a relocation camp where many Japanese families were forced to go to during World War II. Kaku was born soon after his family was released. Well, when I was a child, I had two role models. First was Albert Einstein. He died when I was a child. Everyone was talking about the fact that he, couldn't, he could not finish his greatest work. It was to be the unified field theory, the theory of everything. So I said to myself, that's for me. I want to work on the unified field theory. And that's what I do for a living. That's my day job here at CUNY. But I had a second role model. I used to watch Flash Gordon on the Saturday morning TV, and I was hooked. I mean, aliens, rocket ships, spaceships, uh, invisibility shields, cities in the sky. A whole world opened up to me. Kaku is the physics professor we all wish we had in college. Just listen to him explain how a future elevator to space would work. Yes, he predicts we can take an elevator to space soon. It doesn't fall down because of the centrifugal force of the Earth as it spins. Because right now, you are moving at 1,000 miles an hour because the Earth's circumference is 24,000 miles, and they're 24 hours in a day, so you're, you're moving at 1,000 miles an hour. And so because this line going into outer space is also moving at 1,000 miles per hour, that's why it doesn't fall. Wow, you know, I got a, a C in physics. <laughs> I think if you were my professor, I might have done much better. His latest best-selling book is a combination of these two lifelong passions, physics and the future. Physics of the Future, How Science Will Shape Human Destiny and Our Daily Lives by the Year 2100. So, Mathieu, let's fast forward 100 years. What will the world look like for my great-grandkids and grandkids? Well, think of our ancestors of the year 1900. They were dirt farmers. They only lived to their 40s. If they were to see us today, they would look at us as sorcerers and wizards with rocket ships, satellites, GPS, and all this uh, high-tech wizardry. Now, if we were to meet our great-grandkids of the year 2100, we will think of them as gods. Based on what's happening in science labs around the world, Kaku makes predictions about technology, future space travel, health, and much more. It may sound like science fiction, seriously, flying cars? But Kaku says he has science behind him. People don't realize that we physicists are already laying the groundwork for the 20th century. We already have the capability of putting the internet in our contact lens, the capability of cars that can drive themselves without a driver, wallpaper that's intelligent that can simply change color, flexible paper, newspapers that you can fold up, put in your pocket that is totally intelligent. All this technology already exists. You just said newspaper, so the newspapers will still be around? <laughs> well, in a different form. Realize that we have more horses today than the year 1800. 
except horses today are used for recreational purposes. So we still have live theater when people thought that radio, television, the internet would replace live theater. The lesson is we live with a mix of media. We live with a mix of the past. And so we will still have newspapers, except it may just be one sheet of paper that you put inside your pocket. Kaku also predicts cancers and tumors will soon be just a flush away from a cure. I've interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists. And when I interview the doctors, they tell me that your toilet will be the cure for cancer. How is that? Because your toilet will have what are called DNA chips that analyze proteins emitted from 100 cancer cells in a cancer colony 10 years before a tumor forms. The word tumor could disappear from the English language. We will also zap cancer with what are called smart molecules or nanoparticles. These already exist. Every prediction in my book, and I make hundreds of predictions, have a prototype in the laboratory. The first Asian to become a naturalized American citizen was Hikozo Hamada. Hikozo Hamada later changed his name to Joseph Heko. Originally from Japan, he came to America in the 1850s. In addition to being the first Asian American citizen, Hikozo Hamada, aka Joseph Heko, was also the first to publish a Japanese language newspaper. We invited several prominent community members to talk more about the issues facing Asian Americans. And the first question I asked, who are the Tri-States Asian Americans? about the Asian American communities. Uh, so it's not one coherent, uh, ubiquitous group. It's, it's a wide variety of groups. Our difficulty is that not only are we over a million people, but we're spread out in a lot of zip codes. There's over 40 Asian ethnic groups here in New York City. Um, and so the challenge has become, as a pan-Asian organization, if you represent Trying to represent everybody, oftentimes you end up kind of representing no one at times. And I think the idea of being Asian American um, has taken a while to kind of take hold in a lot of immigrant communities. So I think the key thing is that we've been doing a lot of work to bringing groups together, and I think they see the power of coming together as a unified voice for the Asian American community. Sayu, how has this surge in the Asian American population, how has that impacted New York both socially and politically, you think? Well, so I think one of the things is that we're seeing the emergence of newer communities, the Nepalese, the Tibetan mm -hmm. community. There's a growth in that. I think uh, that's created a set of needs that didn't exist before in the South Asian and more broadly the Asian American community. I do think that the census, because the census identified jurisdictions in New York and elsewhere where there was a significant Asian American population in the elections of 2012, we had to make available uh, language assistance. And so that has created theoretically more opportunities for people to participate in the civic process, the increase in the population, allowing for more specialized services. And Kyung, because your organization um, serves the Korean American community, how does it also make sure that um, its voice is heard and you know, what kind of questions does this raise, your organizations, in terms of what, how government and social services, how they're responding to the needs of um, the more established Asian groups? Well, I think, um, to be clear, our vision and sort of DNA from the very, very beginning was never about Korean Americans just coming together to raise money to just help ourselves. It was really around um, uh, creating a, a, a more robust culture of giving in our community to really um, be contributing to broader communities as well. So if you look right now, we have 18 grantee partners, and they really run the spectrum. I mean, there are sort of smaller and very Korean-focused organizations but there are also sort of broader pan-Asian organizations and we also fund uh, very large established sort of mainstream organizations. And Sayu, let me ask you this, how do you convince um, more traditional groups, older groups that a pan-Asian coalition is really the best option for the community as a whole? I mean I think that is one of our critical challenges as a community, right? So. For me, you know, the argument that I make both to both within the Asian American community and more broadly is that we really, although we have critical mass in the city and critical mass in the country, we don't always always have that critical mass within sort of singular electoral jurisdictions. And so I talk a lot about how we need to value our distinct needs and ensure that those are communicated, but that in order to get policy and electoral outcomes, we have to build power 
by joining with other communities, whether they're Asian American or other minorities or more established American communities. And I think that resonates for people because it's trying to achieve an actual outcome. I don't think, and neither should we ever lose that distinctness of our communities, yeah. but if we can be strategic about how to work together, I think that works for a lot of folks. One of the world's precious fabrics is made from tree-hugging shapeshifters. That's right, caterpillars produce silk. Originating in ancient China around 3500 BC, silk was a lavish fabric only worn by kings. In time, it became an essential good in pre-industrial international trade. The first evidence of the silk trade was discovered in the hair of an Egyptian mummy of the 21st dynasty, 1070 BC. Because of the popularity of silk, the major trade routes between Europe and Asia came to be known as the Silk Road. And here on Asian American Life, we're also showcasing art and culture. An exhibit at the Met brings the seasons of Cambodia right here to New York. The Metropolitan Museum of Art rang in the Lunar New Year with a celebration of the collection of Cambodian rattan, the sculptures of Sophia Pick. Hundreds of well-dressed revelers joined the Asian dancers, toasted the Year of the Snake, and admired his brilliant work. The Cambodian artist lives and works in Phnom Penh and creates his art from rattan and bamboo, natural materials that sustain life in rural Southeast Asia. He creates organic, open weave forms often inspired by human anatomy or plant life, like this piece called Morning Glory. Pick created this as a testament to the years that Cambodians had been forced to survive by cooking these flowers for nourishment. Pick, who was in his early 40s, was displaced to refugee camps along the Thai border with his parents during the Khmer Rouge period. Eventually, he migrated to the United States, studied art at the Art Institute of Chicago, and returned to his homeland in 2002. Among the pieces at the Met is a Buddha made from rattan, where the lower half of its body is unconstructed, a symbolic nod by the artist to Cambodia's recent past. His show will continue at the Met through July 7th and is part of the museum's contribution to the New York-wide Season of Cambodia. What's a product of Chinese hands, inspired by the Japanese and made in America? It's the fortune cookie. Adapting its look and taste from the traditional Japanese cracker, fortune cookies became a popular dessert for Americans during the 20th century in San Francisco, California. Interestingly, the fortune cookie is an American-born dessert, and the Chinese rejected the importation of fortune cookies into China because it was, quote, too American. And now we'd like to end the show with a little tidbit in this case, a little dumpling, a popular dim sum dish. We went to Red Egg on Center Street, a popular dim sum spot. First, the owner gave us a brief history lesson. Dim sum dumplings are made from a rice flour, which gives it a very silky and translucent dough texture. The chef rolls the dough into an oval shape, then flattens it into thin pancake-like crepes, which will be filled with different vegetables, seafood, or meat. So what makes a quality dumpling? Restaurant owner David Wan says you are at a good dumpling by counting the creases. A uh, good high quality shrimp dumpling, for example, has to be between 12 to 14 creases. So the dumplings are done and are placed in a steam bowl to cook. Next are vegetable dumplings, which have a different preparation. The style of making vegetable dim sum dumplings differs mildly from the shrimp. As we can see, they are compressed into little plate-like shapes. The biggest difference is the style of folding for each dumpling. These dim sum veggie dumplings have the appearance of little oranges with the green peas as the navel. From scratch to finish, we're ready to try out the finished product. So, go ahead, try it. I, I got the creases. You got the creases, great. <laughs> mm. That's delicious. Hot, eh? Yeah. The dough yeah. is really good. 
So how many dumplings a day do you make here? Uh, we should do between mm. a thousand or two a day. Mm. Depends the daily business because uh, we have to keep them fresh every day. This is amazing. Great. I give you a thumbs up. Double thumbs up. <laughs> Compliments to the chef. <laughs> When you're in Chinatown, you have to check out the Red Egg and try one of their dumplings. Next time on Asian American Life, we'll take a look at a serious issue, the stereotypes and race-based bullying in the community, and some of the people who are breaking those stereotypes. We'll talk to the members of Far East Movement, the first Asian American hip hop group to have a number one hit on the US Billboard Hot 100 list. When we were first starting, uh, especially when we had our, our songs like Like a G6 out and Rocketeer, when people would come to the shows, they would go, yo, I had no idea you guys were Asian. So, it, you know, it was definitely hope, hopefully we've, you know, opened people's eyes to a different perspective in music. Also, in the months ahead, we'll focus on fashion, Asian Americans' role in the garment industry and those who are in the forefront of fashion design. And politics. What kind of impact will Asian American voters have on the New York City mayor's race? And how are the candidates addressing the issues of this fast-growing and diverse community? We'll also take you on a food tour in Fort Lee, New Jersey, where one community organizer believes the best way to build bridges between communities is through food. We'll have these stories and much more. Until next time, I'm Ernabel DeMillo. On behalf of CUNY TV, thanks for joining us.